This is uh, Subrata Ghoshroy. I am a research affiliate at uh, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology in the program in science, uh, technology, and society. I, along with uh, Jurgen Scheffren, who is going to be one of the speakers today, we are the co-chairs of the International Network of Engineers and Scientists for Global Responsibility. It's a big name and the short name is INES, I-N-E-S. We are sponsoring this uh, webinar today, <clears throat> one in a hopefully a series of seminars that we will hold on important topics of international security and peace. So today's seminar, <clears throat> but before um, I uh, go, I, let me just make a quick uh, a logistical announcement. And that is, we are uh, going to be recording this uh, webinar. Uh, it will be later available for viewing uh, on most likely on YouTube and Lucas Wurl, who is our person in Berlin uh, for Ines is also part of the seminar and uh, he will uh, 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 say maybe more about that later on. Uh, so our two panelists on this very important topic on uh, security in outer space, uh, security and peace are um, uh, Dr. Dave Webb, Who's the, uh, who was formerly professor at uh, Leeds Beckett University, actually professor uh, who, who PhD is in space science and um, is, is going to be the first speaker, I, I believe. And, uh, and our second speaker will be professor Dr. Jürgen Scheffren from Hamburg University, where he is one of the lead persons in the climate research, climate and security cluster at Hamburg. Um, Jürgen, many of you are probably, uh, both Dave and you are much more well known um, uh, than, than I in, in, in Europe. And uh, so we have uh, two very, uh, very important speakers talking on this important topic uh, of space security. So um, we have two uh, topics. One is to deal with the technologies in space uh, that are uh, gradually becoming uh, militarized and, and potentially weaponized in the, in the, almost in the near future. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there is an effort that has been ongoing for a long time um, that there is a proposal for, uh, to ban weapons in space. And it's been tabled by uh, China and, and Russia since 2008. It's um, called Paros, that is well known to many of the people in the audience today, <clears throat> Prevention of Arms Race in Outer Space, which is a treaty to ban uh, weapons uh, from space, in space, uh, and that has been just uh, totally uh, uh, stymied in the conference uh, uh, on disarmament at the I UN. <clears throat> so we have a, a very difficult situation regarding space security. On top of it, uh, although it's not going to be discussed in today's seminar, but it is a, another important topic as that even though we live in a post-Cold War period, we have a situation that is actually just harking back to the very uh, uh, challenging days of the Cold War, where you are now having another bilateral confrontation between Russia and the United States. I mean, Russia is nothing like what it used to be in terms of its global reach and power and so forth. It has a military budget of 60 billion versus the US military budget of 740 billion. And yet the Cold War, it, and mostly um, in the perception of the uh, policymakers in Washington is, is, is going on and we have no dialogue for the, almost the first time since 1960s, there is no ongoing dialogue about nuclear weapons and arms control between Russia and the United States. So it is a very difficult danger. And those who follow the bulletin of the atomic scientist will, will know that the clock hand has moved um, ever closer to the doomsday midnight. So it is, we are in a critical juncture that we need to 
look at these issues and, and get them in the public conversation. We in the United States now, we are in an election season, as you all know. Third of November, there'll be a, 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 a very important critical election, uh, almost in the history of modern United States. And, uh, and, uh, and this uh, topics of uh, military spending, of, um, of, uh, of this weaponization of space, of the tremendous nuclear modernization that has been undertaken by the US military. None of this is, is in the conversation. And that's a, a serious issue. And the final that I'll say is with my, um, very close to my heart is the missile defense. And this missile defense is causing the US missile defense deployment in Europe, in Asia, is causing so much difficulty with the Russians and the Chinese. And it's a completely ineffective, inappropriate, counterproductive, and wasteful program, and we cannot get anything, um, uh, any discussion going. I have just written a piece for the Bolton of the Atomic Scientists laying out the politics of missile defense. If you are interested, you can you can look at it. And uh, for the past 40 years, we're, we're doing this and uh, spending a lot of money. So uh, the, the duality between the missile defense and space is very clear, and Jurgen has thought a lot about it and, uh, and written about it, but um, we, we may be touching on it today a little bit, but in the next seminar, we will talk about missile defense. So without uh, any further ado, I would uh, like to introduce uh, the first speaker. Um, and uh, I apologize, is this Dave or Jurgen? It's me. Oh, thank you. So it's Professor Dave Webb, over to you now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, yes, but I'll just uh, share my screen if I can. Um, okay, can you see that slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I just wanted to add before we start, I'm going to talk mainly about the technologies, uh, why space is important for the military and the kinds of things that are going on in terms of um, development of space weapons or the militarization of space. So I would like to start really by saying that um, this, this last week has been uh, a week when the United Nations um, General Assembly declared that the 4th to the 10th of October should be World Space Week to celebrate the contributions of space science and technology to the betterment of the human condition. Um, it's also been a week that's been adopted by the peace movement and in particular uh, the international network, global network against weapons and nuclear power in space, a grassroots campaigning organization, which I'm also part of, uh, as Keep Space for Peace Week. So as part of that uh, week of, of actions, normally there's actions at all kinds of different bases and um, other uh, installations around the world which are to do with the militarization of space where people can take action or uh, do some information uh, exchange about those, those particular places. We haven't been able to do that so much this year, of course, because of the COVID problem, but there have been a number of webinars ongoing uh, that you could have um, taken part in. Some of you may have already done so. And if you want to know more about that, and there's a poster that goes with the uh, Keep Space for Peace Week, then you can go to the Global Networks uh, um, website, which is www.spaceforpeace.org. There's also a booklet for, uh, that published by the group Beyond Nuclear on the US Space Force and the dangers of nuclear power and nuclear war in space, which you can download from there too. So uh, that's just to bring us, um, uh, to, to get that information out more. And, and this, I guess next year, there'll be also be another Keep Space for Peace Week, which you can participate in. So um, there has been recently in the, the media, some coverage of how important uh, space has become for various uh, state actors, um, including the US, Russia, and China, and that there is a sudden push by these states in particular to dominate and control the space environment. 
In this presentation, I will try to outline why space and satellites are so important to the military, and in particular, the US military, and how Donald Trump's space forces influenced the rest of the world. We will then take a quick look at the various types of space weapons that have been tested or are under development, some of which can be used for missile defense purposes. And then there will be a sum up with the difficulties that we are faced with and have to be addressed if we really want to keep space for peace. And I think um, Jürgen will address those in terms of what's happening at the UN and in terms of treaties, etc. So the military uses satellites for many different purposes. Um, these are the major operations that they use space satellites for. We will be focusing on the military, US military use of space because we have more information about what the US is doing. Uh, we can see obviously what some of the other nations like Russia, China and India are also doing in space, but their information is not as open as uh, it has been for the US. And of course, much of that information that is, is we don't see a lot of other information that's also um, ongoing, but uh, we are able to keep in track of some of it. So the military uses satellites for surveillance, photo reconnaissance, communications, command and control, global positioning, early warning, missile targeting and guidance, missile defense systems, drone operations, and research and development for new weapon systems. Perhaps we could go through some of these in a little bit more detail. Um, the US runs a network of ground-based stations <coughs> that it uses to identify and track satellites and space objects. These are either high powered radars, such as the ones at Filingdales in the UK, near where I live, or Vado in Norway, in the northern tip of Norway, or they can be optical telescopes like the ones in Hawaii and on Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Uh, another network of ground based stations is used for gathering information by intercepting electronic communications and analyzing the huge amount of information collected with extremely powerful computers. The information gathered can supply details of possible military targets or the plan and strategies, plans and strategies of, of rival nations. Satellite communication networks are also uh, enable the military to command and control military actions almost anywhere on earth at any time so that commanders, large and small groups of military and even individual soldiers can be informed during exercises or in specific military actions. Satellites are also um, an integral part of missile defense systems, providing information on missile launches and missile trajectories using infrared sensors. On the left, you can see the current constellation of satellites used for this purpose. It consists of the geostationary satellites of the Aging Defense Support Program, the DSP, and um, also the space-based infrared system of satellites, some of which are in geostationary orbits and others are in highly elliptical orbits to give an overall global coverage. On the right is an image of the proposed new overhead persistent infrared system, which is due to replace the current system in the next few years. Missiles traveling at hypersonic, that is many times the speed of sound, are also uh, being developed that would travel through space to help deliver a prompt global strike anywhere on Earth within 60 minutes. Unmanned space planes are also being developed and have already been tested, some staying in space for over a year before returning to Earth. And there are also projects underway for developing various space weapons. So satellites and space objects are extremely important for the military and they are becoming even more important as projects develop. A major problem with this however is that satellites are extremely vulnerable to attack and a number of different types of anti-satellite or ASAT system 
have already been developed or are being developed at, at the moment. This table, this coming, this table here shows some of those uh, types of space weapon and outlines the types of technology involved. As you might be able to see, some of these systems are disabling either temporarily or permanently, others are more destructive. So let's have a look uh, at some of these in a little bit more detail too. In March uh, this year, the US Space Force officially received its first space weapon, a ground-based satellite communications radio frequency jamming system. Since the 1991 Gulf War, uh, often called the first war in space, or first space war, attempts have been made to jam satellite signals on a number of occasions by a number of states, including Iraq, Iran, and Libya. Disrupting satellite signals could affect the ability of the military to communicate, to command and control distributed systems, and to identify and home in on targets. Directed energy weapons include lasers, microwaves, and particle beam technologies that damage targets with highly focused beams or pulses of energy. They can, can be deployed against personnel, mi missiles, vehicles, drones, and space objects. Some of these systems are planned for deployment for missile defense in the mid to late 2020s but also have applications as ASAP anti-satellite weapons. The top right picture shows the USAF Starfire Optical Range in New Mexico, which uses lasers to help measure atmospheric distortion and obtain a clearer image of objects in space. China's Anhui Instru Institute of Optics and Fine Mechanics also uses lasers to track satellites. A number of states, that, that is the U, including the US, Russia, China, India, Germany, Turkey, and Iran are developing or deploying high energy lasers to be used to blind satellites or as anti-aircraft, anti-drone land or sea-based weapons. In 1997, the US attempted to fire a high powered, over one megawatt powered laser beam from its mid <coughs> infrared Advanced Chemical Laser or Miracle in New York, in, in New Mexico at a USAF satellite. Miracle was able to illuminate the satellite but then failed. But a second lower powered 30 watt laser was then used and temporarily blinded the satellite sensors. This showed that just a few seconds of exposure from a low powered laser can disrupt space based sensors. A medium powered laser could permanently blind imaging satellites. In 2006, <clears throat> China used a laser to illuminate and track U US reconnaissance satellites as they passed over China. The satellite suffered no temporary or permanent damage, despite many media reports to the contrary. Turkey's directed energy weapons system called uh, ALCA is equipped with lasers and microwave systems to destroy or disable drones and aircraft. It's claimed that ALCA is equipped with radar and electro optical systems that can track multiple targets, although it's not clear whether it can be used as an ASAT. It's, however, it may be on the way there. In January uh, this year, it was reported that Israel is beginning tests on a ground-based laser system to intercept drones, rockets, and anti-tank missiles. Apparently, electric source lasers have been able to precisely focus a beam on a long-range target. The system is now being designed to complement Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system and could possibly be developed into an ASAT system at some stage. An airborne laser, or ABL, has been considered as a possible key component of ballistic missile defense for some time. The US, Russia, and China have all had airborne laser weapon programs. Some have origins in a possible use for long-range missile defense, but they're mostly now focused on fighter plane-based systems for use against drones and surface-to-air and or air-to-air -air weapons. 
although they could also be used as ASAP weapons. The original US ABL concept consisted of a modified Boeing 747 carrying a powerful megawatt class chemical oxygen iodine laser. The missile would be disabled by the laser dwelling on the missile body long enough for the heat to damage it sufficiently to cause the warhead to fall short of its target. In 2011, however, after spending over $5 billion on the project in 10 years, the US Department of Defense canceled the program. The idea did not seem proved to be feasible. In order to disable a missile, the aircraft would have to get very close to the target, making it vulnerable to attack. However, it was considered that the concept of a anti-ballistic of a, of a um, airborne laser uh, missile defense system had been proven and the Pentagon is now investigating building the laser technology into unmanned drones that can loiter near or move quickly towards a target in order to shoot down a missile during the launch phase. Such a situation would require less power and the use of drones would mean that there's no danger to onboard pilots. It's not clear whether such a weapon would be also uh, could be used to damage satellites in low Earth orbit at a height of some 2,000 kilometers, unless the drones or the lasers could also be carried to a much higher altitude by another vehicle, such as a, a space plane, perhaps. Cyber attacks are also, um, satellites are also vulnerable to cyber attacks, either to the satellite themselves or to the ground based stations which uh, operate them or receive their uh, communication signals. So for example in October 2007 and July 2008 the Landsat Earth observation satellite was subject to 12 minutes of interference from its Norwegian ground station. In July 2008 Terra AM1 the Earth observation satellite was subject to two minutes interference and again for nine minutes in October. It was reported that hackers had achieved all steps required to command the Terra AM1 satellite, but they didn't actually go that far. Satellites communications could be shut off uh, by in, in this particular way, rendering it useless. Or worse, it could be permanently damaged by burning all of its propellant of pointing its imaging sensor at the sun to burn it out. The ASAT uh, kinetic energy weapon systems envisage the use of weapons that operate by intercepting targets and destroying them either by force or of the direct collision or with the help of an explosive warhead. These kinetic kill, so-called kinetic kill weapons can be launched from the ground or from space. And so far, four nations have actually done that. They've launched rockets or missiles from the, from the ground uh, to, exp to, to actually destroy um, one of their own um, satellite systems. So China did this in 2007. Uh, the US did the same thing with one of its missile defense mis missiles fired from a, from a ship, in fact, from um, uh, uh, USS Lake Erie. Um, that was in 2008. Russia has deployed uh, ASAT system tests of its PL-19 system in 2018-2020 and in 2019 India tested its ASAT system um, mission Sakti, uh, making it um, in its own eyes anyway uh, a new space superpower. So these systems are being tested, have been tested, and these are just a few of the tests that have been made. There are others as well. Although these are the types of systems that often that offer spectacular and visible results, a major disadvantage is that they produce huge amounts of space debris, which can be a significant problem for all spacefaring nations. If the Earth gets covered in too much debris, there's already too much debris really, uh, just a small, it only takes a small amount of debris traveling at very fast speeds to disable spacecraft. So maneuvering spacecraft through this cloud of debris that surrounds the Earth could actually be 
extremely difficult in the future. In 2019, the US uh, issued its missile defense review and this recommended exploring two boost phase intercept options. The idea of intercepting a missile in its boost phase uh, is favorable because uh, first of all, it's very close to its origins rather than its targets. Uh, and secondly, if it can be hit before it can actually um, launch its multiple warheads, then it becomes uh, less dangerous, obviously. So um, these these boost phase intercept options would also have some ASAT possibilities. These are an F-35 fighter plane armed with a kinetic interceptor and a compact high energy laser on an unmanned drone. I think we've already mentioned. The missile defense review also mentions the, in the reincarnation of space-based interceptors involving a space-based missile defense system in low earth orbit. However, there are significant operational and technical challenges associated with boost phase defense. These were highlighted in fact by the American Physical Society in 2003 uh, and two previous boost phase interception technologies, the airborne laser and the kinetic energy interceptor have been canceled. Military space budgets, um, you can see here, this is the amount of money that's being spent on space technologies by various countries. It's a huge sum of money, um, 15.4, in the case of the US, $15.4 billion per year is being spent on military space technologies. Uh, some of the other countries, of course, it's a bit more difficult to find the exact number, but these are probably in the right ballpark. China is $8 billion, Russia 1.6, India 1.8, and so on. Uh, altogether, this comes to nearly $30 billion per year being spent on this kind of technology. And of course, this means that the, the corporations involved uh, in this kind of um, um, in these technologies, so uh, Lockheed Martin, for example, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, uh, all stand to make billions of dollars from contracts produced in, uh, uh, developed during the, for these programs. And they are therefore one of the major driving forces of, of this whole idea of um, militarizing and weaponizing space. So to finish with my particular section, <coughs> Uh, these are the problems we're faced with, basically. Um, the first is dual use. It's difficult to say when satellites are being used jointly from, by the civilian and military uh, sectors of society. So, for example, photo reconnaissance, situational awareness, communications, those things can be of civil use or military use. And um, very often, in fact, the military uses civilian um, space operations in order to supply the information they require for their military purposes. Also, it's difficult to know whether a system might be used for missile defense or whether it might actually be a space weapon being used or could, could be used as a, as a, in an ASAP um, mode uh, to destroy satellites or render them useless. So how do we determine the actual purpose of a space object? That's one of the questions. And of course, some of that will rely on whether you trust the people you're dealing with in the international scene. And um, at the moment, that doesn't look uh, particularly good. Failure of the, the other, another point is the failure of a key satellite at the time of international tension could have disastrous consequences. If a key component of, of um, say, for example, the nuclear uh, system is, is knocked out by accident or by a meteorite strike, say, for example, or just a component failure. And that particular failure is then blamed on a rival state who happens to be in, um, you know, there happens to be a very high 
tensions with at the moment, then uh, this could lead to a disastrous consequence of a nuclear exchange. And the other problem that we have too is the one of space debris, which I mentioned earlier. If, if too much of um, this kind of military activity in space could be causing too much space debris, which could be confining us basically to the Earth, uh, rather than being able to move out into outer space through for exploration and um, and uh, scientific um, discovery purposes. So uh, those are some of the key problems that we have with space and the militarization of space. And I'm hoping that uh, Jürgen now, now will be able to give us some idea of how we might go about solving these difficult problems through international discussion and international treaties. So um, thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thanks. Sabrata, you're, you're still um, muted. Okay. Hello. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Dave, for this uh, uh, fantastic presentation of this overview of all these different technologies that are um, being used for the um, militarization and uh, uh, potentially uh, weaponization of, of space. Um, I must say at this juncture there was, um, that something that is um, evading people's attention is the developments in the United States vis-a-vis space weapons. Um, the people who are now in charge under Donald Trump are the people that were in charge of technology development in the 1980s when President Reagan was, uh, uh, was pursuing this uh, Star Wars strategic uh, defense initiative. And the same people uh, like uh, Dr. Michael Griffin uh, who is now in charge in the in the Pentagon for technology development is is uh, pushing very hard along with these new uh, uh, space force is to demonstrate technologies in space uh, weaponry and that's um, uh, it is not getting a, a tremendous amount of money as Dave has showed it's about fifteen billion which is of course a lot of money for most of the world, but in the scheme of things in the United States with a $740 billion defense budget, the $15 billion is not a huge amount of money, but regardless, it is very much focused now in developing something on a fast track. So um, it, it may be possible that if, if Trump is defeated, that uh, some of these things will be reined in because amongst the Democratic Party, uh, support for space weapons is fairly, fairly minimal. So that's just an aside for people to know the context of why this is, is now so important in the United States and other countries will have to somehow respond like China or Russia. So, okay, so now over to uh, Professor. Uh, uh, oh, one question, I'm sorry, one, one comment. Uh, Lucas, you said that maybe if there are anybody needing any uh, clarifications on Dave's talk before we move to Jürgen? You know, I don't know if there are questions of understanding, but if there are, maybe you can raise them now. Um, and in general, if you have questions, you can use the Q&A box. That's uh, an icon uh, right next to participants uh, on your Zoom screen. And... Um, if you want to uh, raise a question later on with audio, you can also do so. But uh, then we will uh, say out your name um, and you will be recorded and eventually put online. Uh, if you prefer to be in private, you can write uh, in the Q&A function and we will not read aloud your name. And so only your question will be read aloud, uh, but you will remain private. Okay, thank you. So if there are uh, no questions for Dave at this time, we move to uh, uh, Professor Jürgen Schaffern. So Jürgen.
Hello. Can you see the slides? Can you hear me? Yes, Jürgen, we can, we can, you, okay. and I, we see your slides. Thank you. Great. So, um, yeah, thank you, Dave, uh, for your uh, overview about the situation on, on space uh, weapons development. Uh, and compared to this, the development in space arms control and space security are much uh, less uh, in terms of uh, number of activities and in terms of money sp and time spent on it in terms of effectiveness. So I can uh, say a bit about the existing laws and the potential uh, uh, legal op opportunities and options uh, for the future, bringing together different control regimes uh, in terms of uh, space arms control, missile control, and also uh, missile defense control and uh, nuclear control, which uh, are all overlapping in, in one or the other way in outer space. So far, um, as they've uh, explained, we are still at the stage that we have a militarization of space in several decades since the Cold War times. Um, however, we have a growing number of space nations and increasing militarization um, and the privatization of space, uh, the extensive use of satellites. So uh, much uh, depends on satellite use in the civilian and the military domain um, and uh, we are on the threshold of developing and testing missile defense and anti-satellite weapons uh, which could become more effective uh, in the future and could then become a major threat for any space objects. We can say that yeah, so far we have no existing eff effective or efficient space weapons so far but we are on the threshold to have them and uh, a major driving force uh, since decades has been the United States uh, uh, since uh, the 1980s with the SDI program, with the Space Command, the Space Force, and the concepts of uh, US dominance in space and Pearl Harbor in space of previous administration. And uh, um, other countries may follow the American path. Uh, the closest uh, may be Russia with its uh, experience in the Cold War times on um, uh, developing um, space, military space capabilities by China India, um, European countries and other countries also may follow this. So, so the question is, sh should we pass the threshold for militarization to weaponization of space and can it be still controlled? Um, as we have seen, uh, the outer space issue is becoming increasingly complex because of the many different systems in outer space, which are circling the earth and uh, may interact in, in different ways and uh, the different co strategic conceptions uh, using this. Um, you see uh, some of the um, uh, different uh, institutions, in particular in the United States. Well, the complexity of space warfare is increasing. Uh, we have different systems interacting. Of course, we have the different satellites for civilian and military purposes, for reconnaissance, early warning, communication, navigation, and weather. Um, their efficiency depends on several operational factors, the orbit, of course, the altitude, the frequency of the communication, the maneuverability, the hardening, uh, onboard sensors and their lifetime. Then we have uh, missile defense um, and ASAT in this interaction. We have the interaction between missiles or ballistic missiles and space launchers. Um, there, there's uh, an overlap between these systems. Uh, uh, some countries started with military ballistic missiles, some countries started with space launchers, and some were used interchangeably, um, which depends a bit on their operational characteristics in terms of range, accuracy, the countermeasures, uh, and for space launches, the launch preparation and orbit, and uh, of course, the, the payload type, the deployment mode, the propulsion, guidance, and re-entry, and the reliability. Uh, regarding the link between missile defense and ASAT, uh, yeah, they can be used to some degree interchangeably um, and uh, they can increase mutual vulnerability because uh, if you have any missile defense components can be vulnerable to ASAT and any uh, uh, ASAT components in space or on Earth can be uh, vulnerable to missile defense. And uh, in the middle you see different physical um, mechanisms such as explosives, uh, laser, nuclear collision or cyber um, types of uh, uh, weapon use. So we have the problem of dual use, as I said before. Um, outer space is a 
in a sense, a hostile environment has some uh, extreme technical requirements for any space object in terms of the speed, the pressure, the temperature, the uh, uh, lack of gravity and the radiation in this environment. So the systems must be very advanced and uh, uh, ballistic missiles and space launchers are often uh, jointly developed and can be still um, interchanged with each other. Satellites also are often used in a dual use role for both civil and military purposes. Uh, even civilian satellites can take part uh, or provide information for uh, a war, but also for, for arms control purposes. Then the space infrastructure can be used for um, uh, military purposes in, in all the different components, also on the ground. And uh, we can have a, a conversion uh, from uh, dedicated to non-dedicated weapons. So it becomes uh, difficult to draw a clear line between the civil and the military uses. Um, the satellites are vulnerable. So if anything happens in space, we cannot easily say what the reason is for uh, a malfunction. It can be a natural event or a human or technical malfunction. As far as humans are in the loop, it can be an accidental collision with space debris. Uh, it can be also an intentional sabotage act or uh, attack, which uh, needs to be identified. Then uh, uh, any part of the, uh, the ground part, the ground stations are also vulnerable can be disrupted the communication links as well and the satellites also directly. A satellite has many components. Each of them can fail or malfunction or be destroyed. So the propulsion, uh, the fuel, the guidance, uh, the attitude systems, temperature regulation, energy supply, the antenna, which can be big and this, uh, um, the sensors uh, also sensitive to possible attack. And there are many different uh, physical mechanisms to disturb or destroy um, a satellite from electronic disturbance, sensor blinding, uh, changing the orbit, chemical explosion, nuclear explosion, uh, and uh, collision with a, a guided or unguided uh, a projectile, and finally all directed energy weapons and uh, microsatellites, which are very, very small and sometimes hard to detect. Then another part of the complexity is the link between missile space and missile defense. Um, we have the ballistic missiles and the space launches, as I said. So we have also the possibility of an EMP attack, an electromagnetic pulse from nuclear weapons. Um, the mission between missile defense and space weapons um, can be overlapping, so we can use same technologies. Um, the air launch rockets can play a role, as we have heard. Um, even drones to some degree, and uh, which are operationally flexible, have difficult uh, warning and verification problems, and uh, direct energy weapons uh, in space and uh, from, from the ground, which however are not well developed yet. Okay, uh, now what can arms control do? I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's an impossible task because um, there's a lot of in ingenuity into the weapons, but uh, not much uh, uh, into the um, uh, into the arms control options. When you try to control, uh, you can uh, basically try to control mutually or unilaterally every every part of the component of the um, uh, space activity. Uh, particular, of course, the military function, whether it's a missile, or a cruise missile, space launcher missile defense, ASAT satellite, command and control, and so on. Each part can be controlled of a military function. Then the scope of the agreement can be an important issue, whether it's a universal agreement, a global, multi multilateral, regional, or bilateral, or even unilateral measures can be taken. The actions taken can be uh, to limit something, to prohibit, to eliminate, to inform, or to promote certain activities, and then the arms control can focus on the object itself, that uh, physical objects, uh, counting them, counting the number of satellites, uh, missiles, anti-satellite weapons, and so on, and their physical capabilities, the physical parameters uh, uh, that determine their operational capacity. We can look at complete systems or any component of the system, including propulsion. And then finally, the stage and the weapon life cycle can be controlled from research and development to uh, testing, production, uh, storage, the transfer, deployment, use, and the shutdown. 
every stage can be controlled. Um, or usually more easy to detect and control is the use, while research and development is, is more difficult uh, to detect. And deployment is uh, often, uh, has often been in the past uh, the main focus of arms control measures. Now, when you look at the existing or previous uh, control regimes uh, that are well, have some relevance for outer space, and this is very limited. We have uh, the space law, um, which is uh, focusing yeah, in, in the outer space uh, treaty to um, make sure that outer space is um, a, a, a commons for all humanity and not used for hostile use, uh, but for peaceful use. And uh, there are no nuclear weapons uh, deployed in outer space and no military bases on uh, planetary bodies. Um, and there are some related treaties, the Moon Treaty, uh, the Rescue Agreement, the Liability Registration Convention, which are important, of course, important to regulate uh, peaceful use of outer space, um, but are not so much suited to deal with the military uh, use or even the weapons use. Um, and they are also negotiated in, in a forum, UN Copios for peaceful use of outer space, while all the, the military uses are in the conference of disarmament. Then there are some uh, agreements that have some relationship, of course, uh, missile defense. Uh, there was the IB, ABM treaty, which uh, uh, was uh, agreed in 1972 and abandoned in 2002 by the Bush administration, so there is no control in this field. Uh, if you want to go back to this, that might, might be an option to uh, revive the ABM Treaty at some point. Then, uh, of course, missiles have some uh, relevance for outer space. Uh, we have the, the START treaties, uh, the old ones, and the still existing one, which is abandoned next year. And we'll see what, what comes out of this. Um, then uh, the missile technology control regime has some elements which are re relevant. Uh, it's basically an export control regime. And the INF treaty was also abandoned uh, um, by both uh, starting with uh, uh, President Trump. And then uh, nuclear arms control is or has also some relevance uh, because uh, uh, any nuclear weapon can be a threat for space objects. Um, and uh, um, you have the NPT which is uh, limiting to the, the major nuclear powers uh, the capabilities and the comprehensive test ban treaty, which bans uh, testing um, across all, all scales, and the nuclear weapon free zone treaty and the ban treaty, which was um, uh, agreed upon in 2017. And this could be a basis for future nuclear arms control treaties, which then has an effect on outer space. So when we uh, try to control uh, space weapons, uh, we can first of all think about the definition, and this is a very controversial subject. Some say we cannot define space weapons. Nonetheless, you can always make an attempt. You can call, say, space weapon is a device, a component of a system specifically designed, tested, deployed, or used to disrupt, degrade, impair, or destroy space objects in space or from space. And uh, yeah, the, the term is uh, specifically designed. Of course, there are some systems that are not specifically designed, but have a capability. But uh, like for any, uh, for any control, you uh, first of all control the systems that you define, and then you make sure that there is no gray zone um, that needs then to be uh, verified in some way. So it could be orbiting weapons against space, air or ground, or weapons against uh, space objects, which can be controlled. You can uh, uh, direct uh, the control of the weapons uh, to, to avoid the disruption of signals and functions, which is not an easy task, but at least it's not a ultimate destruction of a weapon. So the question is, should we include these in the control or not? Well, probably you want to include the orbital, in, orbital intercept or the hijacking of any space objects or nuclear explosive devices or other weapons of mass destruction with relevance to space, the conventional explosives, the kinetic energy weapons, the directed energy weapons. So these would be the possible targets of arms control. So when we uh, uh, discuss the uh, different steps uh, towards uh, international security in space, we can start with the easy things and move to the more complex. So the easy things are maybe the rules of the road, the risk reduction measures, such as keep out zones or speed limits or space debris limitation, 
uh, or non-interference with any space objects. And this is already has been already uh, under discussion for some time and uh, a lot of supporters uh, for, for this. Then we can develop confidence building, more better information, exchange and transparency, such as better registration of space objects, which is already uh, existing. Um, the hotline for crisis in space and the code of conduct uh, as uh, was supported by European Union. The next step would be a partial control measures in space. Uh, so any element of the space weapons complex could be controlled. You can limit it to certain altitudes or uh, uh, avoid uh, the military use for, spent, uh, for manned missions, limit certain weapon types, testing and physical limits. Um, the most desirable uh, probably would be a comprehensive agreement uh, and, uh, on a space weapon span. That's what many um, in the peace movement um, are favoring. And finally, embed this into integrated cooperative security and control regime. The best is there is no threat between countries and countries are all in a peaceful mode and uh, cooperating with each other and uh, favoring a space sanctuary. Well, to start with, uh, unilateral measures can be taken um, by states to use their vulnerability of their space objects and there are many ways of doing it. You can uh, protect uh, or hide uh, certain components of the space complex on the ground or in space, uh, or even uh, develop camouflage techniques that uh, the purpose of a, a certain object is not uh, um, easily detectable, which is of course then uh, not good for the transparency building. The communication systems can be uh, uh, protected with electronic warfare measures, uh, sometimes using the same techniques that uh, systems are attacked, move to higher frequency of the object, use mixed spectra signal focusing. Uh, you can uh, try to harden uh, any space objects uh, or ground components to some degree, yeah, which is a cost issue. You can shield them against radiation, laser and debris. And uh, the, you move further out into space to make it uh, more difficult to reach the objects, make them maneuverable uh, and autonomous, uh, for instance, by lowering also their communication. Uh, deception is something I mentioned already. The, an attacker is decepted. There is an attack warning. The different functions of a satellite are distributed. So not only one object is doing a function, but many of them. So there's some redundancy and systems can be easily replaced. Finally, active defense against an attacker, shootback options, deterrence options. Then we move directly into the militarization, of course, when uh, any objects move, the takes uh, active defenses could be already uh, also uh, ASAT capability in itself. And then finally, the confidence building um, rules of the road. So the, these are basically things that are already happening. Yeah? So often very much unilaterally taken by states. Uh, in case they, they can uh, afford to pay for it because it's uh, costly to make uh, any space object kind of reducing their, 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 their vulnerability. Um, the, going down the ladder that I explained, uh, we can move from partial to comprehensive space arms control, starting again with a code of conduct and rules of the road. Um, very important would be a ban on testing, a deployment and use of weapons um, above a particular attitude, like 500 kilometers, uh, to, to protect geostationary satellites, for instance. You can protect manned uh, missions in outer space against military attack and uh, restrain certain types and functions of deployment modes to, to limit the, the capability of ballistic missile defense systems, uh, or make sure that micro satellites are not used in an ISAT role. And then uh, uh, yeah, you can uh, control the different stages of the life cycle of the weapon. Um, and maybe uh, starting with the development and testing. Testing, testing ban for any military space activities is probably a very important issue. Um, then you can try to reverse existing space weapons capability once they're developed, which is uh, having a quite, quite a demanding task. And then you can limit the um, interception speed and altitudes of certain systems and ultimately moving to a space weapon span. So here we could have a gradual approach, a step-by-step -step approach. Um, of course, you can always start with a space weapon span and then implement all the other steps within this overall framework. This is a possibility, so you don't have to wait 
with a ban. And uh, in the past, countries were, to some degree, willing to, to ban and uh, leave the details for the future. We have the nuclear weapons uh, ban treaty, uh, which is uh, yeah, implementing a ban for some countries. Uh, some countries can start, others follow. And uh, then the details are left for the future. So what has been done so far in arms control in space? Um, since the early 1980s, uh, since uh, the kind of revival of the Cold War after the detente period of the 1970s and uh, Reagan's Star Wars speech in 1983, there were a number of activities and, and ideas to, to ban space weapons, in particular anti-satellite weapons, like the proposal from the Union of Concerned Scientists in 1983. In the same year, there was a, a proposal by the Soviet Union for a space weapons ban. There were German scientists, the Göttingen came up with the Göttingen proposed a treaty on limitation of military use of outer space. Uh, there was uh, indeed a moratorium um, between the former superpowers in 1985 on uh, ASAT testing, and which lasted for quite some time, um, even uh, beyond the Cold War, end of the Cold War. And uh, there were the uh, still ongoing negotiations uh, and the annual resolutions in UN General Assembly um, against uh, prevention of an arms race in space, or PARAS. Then uh, um, in 2002, and, uh, well, China and Russia came up with proposals on the prevention of the deployment of weapons in space, which was uh, revived in 2014, which looks like a draft treaty. And uh, the United States uh, opposed it from the beginning. Then the, in the US, uh, the Stimson Center came up with a model code of conduct for space assurance in 2004. In 2010, there was a working group on the long-term sustainability of outer space, not directly related to the military use, but you can say a sustainable peace in space could be an option and uh, thinking about criteria for sustainability in space, which includes then uh, space arms control. 2014, there was a proposal by European Union for International Space Code of Conduct. 2017, a group of intergovernmental experts coming up with elements of uh, Paros agreement. And then last year, the Paros resolution in the UN General Assembly Almost all states supported it, uh, uh, except the uh, United States and Israel. Now, you see, it's a complex issue, but there are always ideas and uh, possible solutions to deal with the problem. Yeah, what is clear when, uh, what do you want? Uh, how much are you willing to pay for um, uh, the security gains from arms control? And there are some simple measures uh, on this two dimension axis. On the left, lower left side, you see, some uh, lower cost measures, which however bring lower security gains, They're like the Outer Space Treaty or space cooperation or launch notification or the keep out zones or space debris reduction have some effect on security, but they're not too expensive. In the middle field, you see some measures that have uh, medium efforts and efforts and costs and medium security gains uh, like the code of conduct or uh, a new ABM treaty or uh, approved missile control regime, missile test ban and so on. And the, the more we go to the upper right hand side, you see more efforts are needed, but also more security gains are increased with an ASA test ban, um, a, a space weapons ban, uh, limitations of new weapons technologies for outer space, the elimination of all nuclear weapons and all ballistic missiles. This is, well, the ultimate goal here um, which brings the highest security achievements uh, for the world. Now, this is the idea. Yeah? We could move uh, in the upper right hand corner, but uh, uh, one question is an argument why we cannot achieve this, besides uh, the question of desirability, is uh, the verification, which uh, since the 1980s has been all, always used as an argument against arms control. Uh, uh, things are too complex, we cannot verify. But verification is not an absolute issue. It's a relative issue, depending on what you want. You know? And uh, the overall goal of arms control, as well as verification, is to enhance international stability and re reduce the risk of an unrestrained arms race. And you can easily make the point that 
the United States also has something to lose from an unrestrained arms race. Uh, they may not see it because of their unilateral perspective, but they have the most space objects to lose. And uh, uh, they have to, uh, so many assets in outer space, there is something to lose for the United States from an unrestrained arms race in outer space. So this argument must be made first. And then the next point uh, that needs to be made, um, the question is what can you verify? which is uh, defining the monitoring threshold. And then the next point compared with what should be verified, the acceptance threshold. And there should be a, a balance between these two. The third point is that the efforts for verification should be adapted to the expected security gains and risk. If you expect low, risk, uh, low gains and low risks, uh, you can lower the effort for a verification. Expect high risk, you should do more on verification. The fourth point is that uh, verification is a multifold issue. It includes, of course, technical measures, but not only. It includes also political, legal, diplomatic, and even military activities to make sure that compliance of an agreement is guaranteed. And the fifth point is there is always some residual risk, even in arms control. But uh, if you use this the residual risk to run into a much more dramatic risk as given by the first point, then you may think, uh, yeah, to reduce this residual risk and until it becomes uh, acceptable yeah, by defensive and cooperative measures to make sure that uh, there is no major advantage by cheating an agreement. So I think these five principles are important to understand to see that verification, even in complex situations like in outer space, is possible. And just looking at the technical means, uh, the wide range of technical means that could be used to improve the understanding of the situation in space, the situation awareness in space, and also the verification of an agreement. There are many components on the ground. Uh, any, any space activity on the ground can be monitored by um, on-site detectors, but also by uh, reconnaissance uh, activities. Uh, like uh, you can go to the missile sites, as was done in the Cold War times. You can go also to the different sensor systems. You can also monitor um, the, the, the data transmission and uh, antennas and so on uh, to make sure that things are um, working well and there is no violation of an agreement. That could be even including activities such as societal verification, whistleblowing and organizational verification which are not technical, uh, could improve. Then we have all the objects in space themselves and they, uh, that could be uh, detecting activities in space. Uh, the, all the sensors in space and the, um, the sensors on the ground looking into outer space. So we have in different uh, frequencies, uh, uh, ultraviolet, radar, uh, electro-optical and so on. And uh, space is open to see, to look at. Yeah? From, it's it's uh, transparent. Uh, by definition, it's transparent, so it's not easy to hide things in outer space. Yeah, that uh, Dave mentioned already the space surveillance network. Uh, uh, every country has them that is using space uh, the most in the United States and uh, in Russia. But Europe European countries have also a space surveillance network and looking um, uh, into outer space by radar systems. Uh, certain telescopes, uh, also a very small scale uh, level. And then we have the possible inspection of space launch facilities, which can be done cooperatively, uh, like for the nuclear weapons complex and our nuclear arms control. Uh, there are only a few sites that need to be uh, detected and monitored to make sure that nothing goes into space that is uh, prohibited and forbidden. And here you can use gate controls, gamma detectors, at entry points, mobile X-ray equipment, the neutron analysis, and so on, um, on the ground. So there is there are things available, and uh, the next question is uh, when you look at this two-dimensional matrix, which looks a bit complicated. Um, on the vertical axis, you have different activities which you want to monitor, uh, from the easy thing, nuclear weapon use in space, uh, to nuclear weapon deployment, missile testing missile disarmament, ASA testing of conversion of a space launcher, missile, uh, ballistic missile testing, deployment and capability, and finally space weapons in orbit 
And here you can apply the on the horizontal axis different techniques from remote sensing to on-site sensors, data exchange, overflights, inspection, space tracking, institutional verification, and societal verification. So you basically see that in, in principle, for any activity, you can apply some sort of verification technique. And the most promising ones are the remote sensing techniques and the space tracking techniques. Uh, so looking from space and looking into space. And the others are uh, like on-site or inspections that could detect some, some activities. As I said before, if you want to reduce the risk, you can find possible solutions. It's only the question is how much are you willing to pay compared to the risk reduction that you get from the arms control. Uh, so Jürgen, this is to Brad. Yeah, Can you moving eat? to the end, uh, saying again for, for the uh, detection of space activities, we have a two dimensional matrix again uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the, the efforts and costs, and then the vertical axis, the benefits you get from detection of activities. And uh, of course, the most complicated ones are the, the hidden activities in outer space and uh, the deployment of these systems. So ultimately, coming to the end, critical issues are. The uncertainties of residual space weapons capabilities, how do you deal with that? Um, can these uh, residual capabilities be constrained? And uh, what about the definitional issue? And uh, yeah, um, uh, if a, a, a satellite is not working, what is the reason for it? So these are some critical issues that need to be further discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jürgen. So we have about 15 minutes for Q&A, so I'll turn it over to Lucas. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, now is the time if you want to raise your hands um, when you open the chat, uh, you should be able to do this uh, to post a question. And uh, we also have five questions uh, in the Q&A section, you may also use the Q&A section to pose a question. And uh, I would go for the first question now via the Q&A. And then I see that it's already uh, Alice uh, who has raised her hand to uh, ask a question. So the first question is a question to international public law. Uh, are there some current regulations on outer space and debris? What could we expect in this manner soon? Who will be responsible for collecting debris there? It could be a huge problem for the environment uh, in the future when nothing doesn't change. Thank you for your answer in advance. I think uh, we touched on this uh, lightly. Uh, Dave, Jürgen, uh, Suprata, do you have uh, more information on this? Uh, maybe Jürgen. Well, I was going to add Maybe something. Dave, Dave for the rest of hand. I was going to just say that <clears throat> I don't think there are any um, international regulations on uh, production of space debris, unfortunately. There have been talks and people have been trying to get something sorted out. But as far as I know, the, um, the Outer Space Treaty does offer some kind of guidance about space debris. For example, it has in its Article 9, um, it provides that state parties to the Outer Space Treaty shall, shall conduct all their activities in outer space with due regard to the score, corresponding interest of all other state parties to the treaty. So that kind of gives a certain responsibility to people acting in space, to space actors, to, to be responsible, to do something, you know, to behave responsibly in space. Um, there's, there's also, I think the question involved in the question is, who owns the debris, basically? And I think that's also part of the Outer Space Treaty, that it should be, uh, any items in space are, the, are owned by the people who put them there, basically. So their responsibility are the people who have launched or, or created that, uh, th those pieces. Now, that doesn't, I suppose, if you blow up a satellite and there are satellites of another nation and that, that satellite spreads debris around, does that mean it still belongs to the 
the nation who put it there or or is it the responsibility of the people who blew it up it, all these things are not really worked out not really decided um there have been some collisions between satellites of different nations which have spread debris around the earth but uh nobody has been able to clear that debris up i think there are a number of different um operations being developed to try to clear the space of uh, to clear out the space of debris but it's not that simple a solution it's not that difficult to it's not that easy to do so i think we still need some uh, more guidance some more regulations on what uh, people can do in outer space and who who would be responsible for clearing it up really what i would say space debris is uh, in the, at the moment it's treated like accident yeah it's uh, um, it's a cost issue some uh, some space objects are hit by space debris and then they have to just cover the cost of this space object you lost it you lost it in space if the problem is increasing of course the international community may be more interested to avoid this uh, space to be or at least to monitor it better and have some warning systems and uh, this is still left to the major nations who have good uh, space uh, tracking capabilities to observe these objects and provide some warning in case of a, a serious concern uh, of course the space station should not be destroyed <laughs> By, by, by space to be nobody wants that uh, but uh, if it's a regular satellite uh, usually nations accept uh, the destruction of that satellite by space to be it's uh, again it's a cost issue how much effort do you um, apply to avoid that risk uh, if it's worth if, if the costs are higher than the the value of the space objects countries are hesitating to uh, to do that and uh, uh, there are talks about these issues, there are conferences about these issues, and a better understanding of the space debris, but no solution yet. Thank you very much. Um, I will read aloud another question that was asked in the Q&A. Uh, what about the way aid donors to India are out of by India wasting money on a military space tech development? I think that means put off by India wasting money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so put off might by be able to answer that, perhaps. Uh, actually, I'm I'm sorry, I missed the question. Can you repeat that, uh, Lucas? What about the way aid donors to India are put off by India wasting money on a military space tech development? Uh, okay. Well, I I don't know about uh, state donors, uh, uh, foreign aid, uh, UK uh, uh, and others probably have uh, uh, foreign aid donation programs to India. And um, the uh, there is a debate within the country about um, using precious uh, resources uh, in very, I guess, high prestige and um, programs like the space program. I mean, this is a, uh, uh, an issue of great national prestige for Indians. Uh, at the same time, uh, we do not have uh, fresh uh, drinkable water and cannot control uh, the pandemic or the AIDS and so forth. Yeah, so these are serious issues, but I don't think there has been any coordinated effort in questioning uh, and the question of national sovereignty is, 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 is in place. So I don't know if the aid donors want to uh, question India, then, I mean, if India cannot do it, then who can do it? Just because it is uh, a, a poorer country, it has its own rights to develop its technologies and, um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and self-defense. So it, it's, it's a very hard issue I think for donors to simply say, well, India, you cannot do it. Whereas uh, other countries can merely go, go ahead and, and, and do it. So it's, it's complicated that way. Well, the problem is that countries follow the, the main player in this field. Yes. Which is the United States. Right? Exactly. exactly. So if the United States is continuing with, an arms, uh, with weaponization of space, other countries will follow. And ult ultimately, it will be maybe acting against the interests of the United States at some point. This is my argument. 
it's 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 a very very a very good argument, uh, but uh, it it does not uh, that kind of rational argument doesn't carry water in 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 Washington because they they want to capture the uh, <laughs> the last sort of high frontier which is space and oh, yeah. little do they realize that there is no such thing. The question is: Are there any rational arguments accepted <laughs> in this administration? Yes. Okay, the next question, um, uh, Alice, uh, I would um, ask you to turn on your microphone on now and you can ask your question now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your wonderful, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I hope we can get Jürgen's slides, particularly the last one with the arrow showing where we're heading because I think we have to elevate the conversation to show that it is possible through all of this wonderful technical information, it is possible to end and ban weapons in space. And that's the part of the conversation that's missing in America, where is who's the major perpetrator and in the NATO countries and in you know the wannabes like India, they don't know it's possible. And we have a good example with Russia and China, and I think we have to elevate it that they kept proposing a draft treaty and we rejected it. The US vetoed any discussion on the committee and disarmament where you need a consensus. So I don't know how we do that, but I think all of our technical knowledge that you guys have uh, assimilated is fabulous. And now how do we put it into baby talk and get it out to the rest of the world that it's possible. We have all the information we need. We can ban weapons in space. I don't know, do, do we have any connections to uh, PR or, um, you know, you know, people that want to uh, fund uh, maybe a communications project to get this news out and get it into the public arena? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, Alice, I, maybe I, I will uh, say a couple of words here, and I should have uh, probably said that in the introduction, and that is that we are, we have been, uh, this is an international working group on space weapons and missile defense that uh, I have been coordinating for the past three, four years due to various reasons we were unable to um, continue the group uh, in terms of its discussions to start um, a, 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 a consensus agreement on recommendations. Uh, at this time, we are hoping that we will finish this report in another couple of months that we have written and people like Jurgen and Dave Webb have contributed very significant articles. And part of this is, is part of this presentation today. And, uh, and others from Russia and uh, China uh, that, and India so we have a, a, a large number of uh, articles and, and I think we are, after this presentation, I think we, we I feel that we can circulate uh, some uh, proposed uh, draft uh, uh, ideas for a space control treaty that Jürgen has laid out and, and Dave, and maybe that could be done relatively quickly. It's only going to be a draft uh, proposal because we cannot reach consensus in such a short time with technical presentations, discussions, etc. Mm -hmm. But with that document of this report of the, and Alice gets the credit for initiating the initial work from Abolition 2000, that that report can be used as a talking point from what you're talking about. Let me, let, thank you, Alice, for your, for your question. And uh... The argument is always like this, uh, space arms control is so complicated, it's uh, impossible. I, I said, yes, space is a complex subject. Space arms control is complicated, but you can always find some sort of solutions if you are willing to accept some, some residual risk. And my point is that this residual risk, which is often used as an argument against arms control, um, is lower than the risk of an unlimited arms race, of the unlimited development of weapons all over the world. And uh, this is the main point, I think. And interestingly, in the past, the superpowers in Cold War times accepted agreements like the, the Biological Weapons Convention, 
without thinking about all the details about all the possible violations from from uh, biological substances and then the chemical weapons convention was agreed uh, and uh, even though there are almost a finite number of poisonous substances that you could use there is no perfect uh, control there is no perfect verification of an arms control agreement but still in the past countries accepted it even in the worst cold war times and the abm treaty was also agreed without a perfect verification system simply because the country thought that the security gains of the agreement are higher than without the agreement and this can be the same can be said for any arms control measure in space thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Um, i will read aloud the next question um, would a collaboration between the US and UK on any kind of resurrection of the nuclear detonated X-ray laser reach both articles one and two of the NPT? Uh, I don't know. Um, good question. Um, because it does require a nuclear detonation as, as described there. It's not sort of as relevant to the NPT as some other things because it's not a nuclear weapon as such, although it is a weapon that's initiated by a nuclear explosion. So I'm not really sure about that, whether that would fit with the NPT or not. Uh, Dave, I, I think that that would be, I would think would be a clear violation of the OST, the Outer Space Treaty of placement or any kind of nuclear explosion in space, I think, is is banned. If I'm if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong. Yes, if it occurs in outer space, yes. If it occurs and in outer space. Question is: uh, Is it a wep nuclear weapon? And uh, uh, there have been uh, some attempts also to, to define nuclear weapons, and there are always some gray zones. And uh, for that, for these questions of gray zone technology, there must be a. a, a organization or institutional mechanisms to discuss it. Keep in mind that for the ABM treaty there was such an institutional mechanism to discuss critical questions in agreement between the nations. And uh, of course beyond some level uh, X-ray lasers could become a nuclear weapon. The question is at which point and they need to discuss this threshold. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we covered this one also a little by Alice. Uh, is there a better way to promote the draft space ban treaty promoted by Russia and China in 2014 and 18 in the Committee on Disarmament and vetoed by the US? Well, as, as long as there is a conflict between the powers say between Europe, Russia, or Europe and China, or the US and China, it's unlikely that they will accept it. So it depends on the political. If there is superpower geopolitical competition, it's unlikely that other major powers just simply join an existing agreement. But they could come up with their own proposal. That they can take any part of the Chinese-Russian proposal and submit it themselves in the Conference of Disarmament, and then they uh, make a talks and negotiation about it. So they don't have to simply join the Russian-Chinese proposal, but come up with their own. Thank you. Um, we have another more technical question. Is the GEODSS facility on Diego Garcia covered by the leasing agreement between the UK and US over the US uh, over the use of the British Indian Ocean territories on the Chagos Islands. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, basically, the, the, the whole thing about Diego Garcia is covered in um, corruption, really. I mean, the, the British stole the islands in the first place, call, called them uh, British Indian Ocean Territories, 
and then basically handed over uh, Diego Garcia to the US for a huge military base. Um, so, you know, there's, they're basically a legal act uh, in the first place. I think um, if, if we, even if it was part of sort of British ownership, if you like, but part of British territories, we have many U US bases in the UK where um, basically the US can do whatever it likes uh, on, on those bases. And, and uh, even the military, the personnel that work there are above UK law, uh, as is evidenced by a few occasions when some accidents have occurred or people have been injured or in fact uh, recently via a base at, at uh, Crowton in near Oxford in, in the UK, a young man was killed on his motorbike by one of the people coming out of the base, driving on the wrong side of the road. Um, and uh, they weren't even working at the base. It was a woman who was married to per, uh, one of the base personnel, uh, but she was taken home immediately and um, is not, remains unanswered. Uh, her, she, she, you know, just, justice basically has not been able to be achieved because the, um, ex the uh, what do you call the law, the way you try to get people back to answer for their cr crimes, um, the US has, has um, refused to, to do that. So, uh, you know, basically the US in its bases act above the law, perspective of, of where they are. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. Um, we have two more questions. Um, what would be the first step we can all take with our respective governments? I think we touched this a little, but uh, what can we do directly? Is there something we can do right now? Or do we have to wait for the Enos booklets or brochure? <laughs> I think some, some of it's been said already. We need to keep highlighting what's, what's actually happening because there's not a lot of information on this uh, that people are aware of. So people need to be made aware of the current situation and how important it is that we get to a, a kind of an international agreement on all of this. And then we just keep lobbying the, our governments to, to participate and to push um, America, basically, who is the main, main obstacle, into, into, into actually movement, you know, movement towards gaining a treaty. Thank you. Our last question. Um, how do you assess NATO going into space as announced in the 2019 London Declaration? Maybe I can make a first comment then leave the rest to date. Um, uh, so far, there are some NATO countries had their own uh, military space uh, satellite projects. Not so far the weaponization of space. It's uh, just a uh, for communication or reconnaissance purposes. Um, if they want to further military space, the question is, who is providing the technology? Is it just the nations uh, and the military forces are paid from their own military budgets? Or is it somehow European Space uh, Agency involved? And then this should not be possible because the, the ESA or Space Agency is uh, devoted to peaceful and civilian uses of space. So it can be not in this framework of the ESA. Uh, they must create their own mechanisms to do joint activities um, beyond the, the national activities. Dave? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's not really surprising that uh, NATO wants to move into the space regime, into the face domain, because um, that has already been declared by the US, where <coughs> they believe a lot of action is going to take place in the future. Um, and this um, establishment of the US Space Force has been, I think, um, kind of very, very much 
push people into doing more into the militarization of space themselves. So, for example, um, as we know, Russia, uh, China and, and India have also always been, in, or not always, but have been involved in major space projects. But now other countries are also starting to become more involved. The UK, for example, is setting up a sort of um, miniature my, uh, mini satellite system uh, of its own and of also developing spaceports to launch mini satellites from. France is putting a considerable amount of money, euros into developing a kind of a space force of its own. I think uh, South Korea, Japan, sorry, South Korea and Japan have also expressed uh, some kind of wish to get involved in all of this. So it's it's not really surprising that any organization or any nation which has a major military would also be involved too. So we have to stop this before it gets really out of hand. It's already part way out of hand, but we've got to stop it before it goes completely crazy and, and everybody's just rushing into space, spending billions, which could be spent on far better things, uh, far more useful things here on Earth. So, Prater, I'm... Try again to unmute yourself, please. Oh, I'm getting muted. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, what I was going to say is that I think that for NATO, there is a, a real issue because they now are, are totally uh, entrenched with the American uh, missile defense systems. And as Dave pointing out that any missile defense system will have a space component. And then also now NATO is way outside of its own boundaries in Afghanistan and, and elsewhere. So for military operations, you need space. So there is no way you do not have a space component if the current modus operandi continues. Thank you very much. We have answered all your questions. It's uh, a few minutes after 5.30 uh, Central European summer time. Um, it was a pleasure to listen to your presentations. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your enlightenment. Uh, thank you for participating. Um, we will send you the video and as well, uh, well the PowerPoint presentations uh, in the next days. And we invite you to our next webinar, which we will announce uh, in the next couple of months, uh, weeks. So um, have a wonderful day, evening, night, uh, to wherever you are right now. And we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Bye-bye.